Uh, last week, Pastor talked of the uh, 400 silent years, which really aren't silent. God was at work. It's just not recorded to us in Scripture. Alluded to um, through, particularly in the book of Daniel, where you have the, uh, the statues and then dreams that talk about upcoming empires, and some of those empires took place within those 400 years. And then today, uh, Lesson 120 is the, the review for that unit. Um, there was a video to go with. Um, it's a, I don't want to say a long video, but it's not a short video either. And uh, probably I'm just going to pass on the video and look, uh, just kind of discuss, talk about some of the different things that we've seen um, in the last nine, ten weeks and um, set the stage as we cross that 400-year divide and step into the New Testament starting next week. Um, so we will spend some time there. Now, depending upon the, the Bible that you have, and again, we've talked not necessarily Bible translation, but Bible printing. Um, what? It'll make it. There's a floor to catch it. Um, it'll fall. Um, depending on the Bible that you have in the printing, you may have a substantial amount of notes right here as you cross from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, other Bibles, um, such as, say, the Thompson Chain Reference, put most all of their notes at the back. They have, a, they have an entire appendix of like 400 pages at the back with all, all sorts of notes and references, and then they have their encyclopedic information, which goes through and talks about people, people, uh, people, places, and things. So depending upon the Bible printing that you have, um, you may have a large section of notes here. Sometimes talking of looking back, saying, hey, this is what we've covered so far. This is how God has worked. Uh, sometimes looking forward, hey, this is the set the stage for what's to come. And sometimes start trying to uh, build that bridge to see where we've been and where we're going. Now, one of the things we often do, I say we, I'm sure you never do this. I have all these great notes that I never look at. Um, for instance, you may have an introduction to the Bible right, after you, right before or after your table of contents. Have you ever looked at it? It may tell you, well, here's, it may, for instance, if you have the King James Bible, some put in an introduction to the King James Bible and how, how it was developed. It's a good thing there's preachers because they, they have to read that. I don't. Right? Isn't that the way we often look at it? Hey, they told me what it says. I don't have to pay attention to it. And we, we have these notes that are added to, they're, they're not a part of the Bible, but they're added to the Bible to help us understand it. And so often we don't pay attention to what's there. And sometimes it's pretty helpful information. Um, and it's helpful to us because it helps us not necessarily to better understand the Scripture, but under, better understand the context of Scripture that helps us to better understand the Scripture. Uh, just throw this out, and this is weeks down the road. Uh, when Paul is talking, he's, he's, he's crossing cultures as he talks. He's talking about the Roman culture. He's talking about the Greek culture because they were still, even though Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire lived and died during the 400 years you talked about last week, it was still considered um, what was the common language that all these folks spoke in the Roman Empire, Greek, because it was like English today. It was the, it was the international language. Everybody understood it. So you have Paul as he writes. He's talking to the to the Latins, if you will, the Romans. He's talking about the Greek culture. He's talking to the Jews. And if you don't understand that he's got three different, completely different cultures as he's talking, uh, there are some things that you look at and he's like, okay, I really don't understand that. What's he trying to say? And the reason that this, it can be difficult for us here in America in 2021 to understand what he's trying to say is because we don't take time to do the study to understand where's he coming from. And so we have these notes. Sometimes they're really helpful to us. And my one of the admonitions that I would have for you today is take advantage of those. 
uh, look at them, read them, see what's there. So we're in this, this review lesson today. Let me get back to that page. My notes today are all of the title, unit review, very profound title, and one page of questions. That's it. Normally there's like eight or ten pages of notes here. Um, I mentioned that there was a video, and it's like, eh, probably not. Uh, the video is not terribly long, 16 minutes, um, not short. Typically when we're looking at videos to use for class like this, we're looking at five to ten minutes or so for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, the video just keeps going. I think I'll catch up on my sleep real quick. Uh, we would never do that, but that does happen. And the other is um, sometimes I've got stuff I want to say. And so, you know, we try to keep them a little bit shorter. The, the topic of the video, though, is good, but we've, t we've talked about this. Pastor had a, a series that he did a couple of years ago on apologetics. And here's the question that the video is focused on, and we're going to talk about it just briefly here. Why 39 was the title? Why 39? Wouldn't it be nice to be 39? But that's not what they're asking. They're asking why only 39 books? We had the 400 silent years. Was God truly silent? Well, no. Is it recorded to us in the scriptures? Uh, no. However, you could go, depending on which Bible you use, you could find Bibles that have books placed in this intertestamental period. So why does the King James Bible that most of us would be using, why would it have only 39 books? And there's some good questions there. Um, and the answers are, are interesting. And we could ask the same question as we look ahead. Why only 27? Uh, why, do we, why do we have a Bible and say that this is God's completed, in, uh, inspired Word of God? Why do we have a Bible that has 66 books? And here's some of the things that we have, uh, some of the, 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 the questions that we could easily answer. I say easily. If it were easy, we wouldn't have Bible, so we wouldn't have the Apocrypha, would we? So uh, easy may not be the right word. Um, but we talked about this way back in the beginning, like lessons one, two, and three, like back in the beginning. How can we know that the Bible is indeed the Word of God, then we can put our faith and trust in the book that we have before us? And one of the, the proofs of inspiration is the consistent storyline. Not necessarily the term that we would use, but the consistent storyline. That is, the Bible has a, a consistent focus. Um, if you are like I, uh, you have glasses that have different focal points. Blessed things, aren't they? They're helpful. As long as you're looking through the right focal point. Um, and in some cases, you have bifocals, and in some places you have cases, you have trifocals. And you can have a focal point at the top, in the middle, and at the bottom. And you want to be sure that you're looking through the right focal point, else everything seems blurry. Have you ever encountered that? Yeah. And I've mentioned before, the, the, one of the last things I do at work before I have to leave each day is get up and walk on the sorter, which is this blessed piece of equipment that uh, gets boxes to, to your house, okay? Um, you get up and walk on the sorter and you're, eh, I don't know how tall we are, 25, 30 feet up or something like that. Um, I want to make sure I'm looking through the right focal point so I know where I'm putting my foot. Um, at work, when we're talking to the people about safety, I say, hey, make sure you put your feet where feet are supposed to go, that you know what you're stepping on, that it's solid and secure. We don't want you to get hurt. Well, how do you know that? You use your eyes. Well, what if you're like me and your eyes have multiple focal points? If you just take a quick glance down, you may not see that small package that you step down and you don't step down, you step on. And if you step on, you hurt an ankle. Okay, so you've got to be careful. When we're talking about scriptures, one of the proofs of inspiration and the proof that we have the completed inspired word of God is that there's a consistent focal point. Everything that we've talked of to this point is looking ahead to what's right around the corner. Even though much of what we've talked about for the last couple of units has been historical. As we've looked back at what did take place. 
and we've talked about the kings. We had most of an entire unit talking about the kings of Israel. We had most of an entire unit talking about the kings of Judah. And then we had most of a unit talking about the prophets. Most of the prophets that we saw were related to Judah, except for those very significant ones that spent a lot of their time in Israel, like Elijah and Elisha. And so we have these people. While we're looking at them, this is a historical study talking about people who were living, they weren't, when we look at the lives of Elijah and Elisha, I mentioned them, we don't see them prophesying about the coming Messiah. And yet we can say with 100% certainty that the Bible has a consistent focal point. Because it's not what's happening in this day, it's what's happening over these years. Um, one of the questions that often would be asked by young people that have a desire to serve God, how do I know the will of God for my life? And the easy answer is, obey the will of God for your life today. If I do what God wants me to do today, guess where I'm going to find myself? In 15 years. How do you make sure that you, oh, we just went on vacation, went to Upper Michigan, okay? How do I know that I'm getting to Upper Michigan when I'm supposed to, the way I'm supposed to. Well, I make all the right turns along the way. I can't worry about, um, basically, it's pretty simple. Um, you get on the turnpike and you don't get off the turnpike till Toledo. It's pretty simple. Um, how do I know that I'm gonna get where I need to be? Well, I better make sure I get the first turn right. If I don't get on the turnpike, I'm stuck, okay? So uh, you've got to make the first turn. And then what do I do? Do I worry about the last turn when I'm still in Pennsylvania? I'm not worried about pulling into mom and dad's driveway while I'm in Pennsylvania. I make today's turn right. How do I know that I'll be doing the will of God in 10 years? I do the will of God today. Well, when we're talking about, hey, there's a common focus, sometimes we can get distracted by what's happening around us and lose sight of the big picture. And there's this big picture. So we've got 39 books that have this common focal point. If we talk about the apocryphal books, you know what we find? All sorts of other non-focal point topics. Uh, we will call the Bible the canon. Now, this is canon like a collection of books, not canon like a military arm armament. Okay, this is canon with two ends, not three. Uh, and why do we call it the canon? You may have, this, again, this will be in the notes in your Bible, probably back there by the table of contents. It's tucked into most every Bible, unless you get like the, uh, the student award Bible or something like that. But it's in most Bibles, the, the canon of Scripture. Well, what is the term canon, C-A-N-O-N, what does that term mean? If we call it the canon of Scripture, and, and you, you, I can almost guarantee You've heard a preacher say, we have the completed canon. Have you ever stopped and asked, okay, what does the word canon mean? If they're going to make such a dogmatic statement, it might be important that I understand what they're saying. So what does it mean? And, and, and you'll like this, especially, I heard some of you talking about building a little bit earlier, if you are into building or have a job that deals with measurements. Basically, it was their tape measure. It was their yardstick. It was their measuring tool. Um, and it became a, a common word for anything that was used as a measure or to measure other things or to evaluate that which would be judged. Now think about that for a moment. The term canon originally used as a word to define their tool for measuring. I've mentioned before, we don't like the term evolution when it relates to science, but evolution happens. Evolution of languages. Think of how languages have changed. Thou art a great and wonderful people. We don't say thou art a great and wonderful people. We sing it, we read it, but we, when was the last time you used the word thou in a common sentence? Right? So languages change. And the, the term canon it evolved over time. It went from simply meaning a tool for measuring, a reed specifically, to becoming anything that would be used to evaluate or to judge. You won't believe this. Uh, back when I was teaching in Texas, I had some students that gave their senior gift every year. 
they gave me a big, wide podium. It was probably 48 inches wide. Can you guess why? Keep my stuff from falling on the floor. Um, so the term canon is a tool used to measure or to evaluate. What does God's word do for us? What do we use it for? We use it to measure, to evaluate, to see, am I where God wants me to be? Am I doing what God wants me to do? It is a tool for me. Ha, there's another way to do this. We just skipped this thing altogether. Ha, ha, ha. Um, so it's a tool or a measure. Now, stop and think for a moment. What is it measuring? It's measuring me. How do I line up with where God wants or what God expects of me? Am I where doing what he wants me to do? How about church? Not Cedar Hill Baptist Church, but the church, that, that universal church we'll hear about sometimes. If I'm going to look out and say, these people just aren't doing things the way, it's not my opinion that counts. It's not up to me. I have to be able to look at the Word of God. That is the tool that I use for evaluation. Uh, we talked about this months and months and months ago. Um, the internal evidence used to support the dating of the Old Testament books. How do I know? Uh, and we mentioned this, again, a couple months back. Uh, the Bible that we have is not laid out chronologically. It starts with Genesis it ends with Malachi, Old Testament, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and the stuff within, if you had to use this as your map for taking steps, you'd be walking. Uh, remember the old family circus cartoons in the paper? And if you remember, sometimes on Sunday it would show Billy as he traversed the neighborhood going to tell his parents something. And he never went in a straight line. He was all over the place wandering around. Well, that's kind of the way the Old Testament is. As soon as we leave Deuteronomy, it is not in a straight line to Malachi. It is all over. Keeping in mind that it still has a singular focus. But it's not laid out chronologically. And so if you have a chronological Bible, and perhaps you have one at home, if you have a chronological Bible, um, here's the great question for you. Where does the book of Job fit? You get an entire book, not a short book, an entire book. If you want to say, is out of place chronologically. That's not a problem for us. Because the Bible, while it has narrative in it, is not a narrative that reads from point A to point B. It's, it, it is a book full of information that tells us what God expects of us. And yet, throughout these lessons, 119 prior to today, how many times have I given you information that said, according to Answers in Genesis, this is placed at such and such a time, or this is a, happened at approximately this year? And sometimes we can nail that down to an exact year, which is interesting because this didn't happen 10 years ago. And this didn't happen 25 years ago. This didn't happen 225 years ago. This did not happen 2,025 years ago. Old Testament, that's prior to the birth of Christ, so that's in a different dating system. Okay? And so last week, as, as, we, as we talk about the 400 silent years, and you have Alexander the Great in the Greek Empire, how do we know when David is talking about this statue and the, different, and the different levels or layers of the statue that talk about these, allude to these different empires, how do we know when this took place? Well, well who cares? Uh, it helps us to better understand and to show the proof and veracity that God's scripture is inspired. And there's, there's different things within. And there are different times within the scripture that the writer will say that this happened at this time. There's internal dating. Uh, throughout the prophets, we find that especially. In the fourth year of King Uzziah, I received a vision of the Lord. And you have something along, the, not those words, but something like that throughout the book of Isaiah. The first half of the book of Isaiah, very often, he would say that this happened at this time frame, or in this time frame. 
This happened at this point. And you'll find that as you go throughout the scripture. That internally, the pieces fit together because the writers would give time references. They did not date it. Did they know that the entire dating system for mankind would change at the birth of Christ? No, they didn't know that. So they didn't give us a B.C. date. But what they did is they would say, hey, at, at this time, look at what happened. Here's what talk, happened. God talked to me and told me to take this message to the people. And so we have an internal dating system. does not tell us in what year this happened, but it tells us at what time this happened. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, for example, Second Chronicles 10 must have been recorded before 722 B.C. You say, well, what does that, difference does that make? No, we're saying that the Bible tells us, uh, gives us hints and clues as to when these things took place. It says Second Chronicles 10 must have been recorded before 722 B.C. because at that point, Israel was no longer a nation and couldn't have rebelled against Judah. So again, it helps us to see time frame. Apologize. Why only 39 books? That was the question in the video. Why only 39 books? Well, we know that we can trust the ones within the time frame because they're the ones that were shown to be uh, documented, provable, that showed them that they were inspired. And they gave information within the books to show the time frame in which it took place. Another example, that was uh, 2 Chronicles 10, uh, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah uh, recorded that the words of the prophet were written down by Baruch, Jeremiah's secretary. Well, what do we know? He himself did not write all of his book, but he had a secretary that wrote some of that. And so I say, well, how did he write it when he was in prison? Did they give him, or, no, when he was in the deep and miry pit. How could he write that? Did he, it tells us, you know what? He could have spoken out of the pit, and his secretary wrote these things down. He said, well, what difference did that make? Remember, within the Answers in Genesis uh, program here that we've been using, one of those words common, especially at the beginning, was that term skeptic. The skeptic doesn't need to have a solid, provable point to make his point. The skeptic, anything that looks like it might be a problem, becomes a big problem. Have you ever encountered somebody like that? How can you believe the Bible? Because this is off by that much. Well, what difference does that make over 4,000 years? Well, it doesn't, but that's their one molehill that becomes the mountain to their faith. And how could Jeremiah write this when he was in the pit? I never thought about that before. What difference does it make? To the person that has their issue, it can be a big thing. And so it's talking about here... You know, we need to understand that sometimes the clues are given within the text. But if you believe the Bible is the word of God, you read right through it and really don't notice it sometimes. To the person that doesn't believe, that can be an important, an important uh, clue to help unlock the understanding of Scripture. Well, then we go to the Apocrypha, those intertestamental books. Um, how did the Jews view the Apocrypha? Again, the question, how do we know that the 39 books that we have in the Old Testament are the 39 books that belong in the Old Testament? Well, how, how did the Jews view the Apocrypha? It's interesting. They viewed them as important literature, but they did not view them as part of God's Word. Sometimes they viewed them as important historical literature. Sometimes they viewed them as important poetic literature but they did not view them as important theological literature. Well, what difference does that make? Uh, question. Who were those books written to? Who were those books written about? Don't you think that their view might be important at that point? They viewed them as important, especially when you talk about the Maccabees, and, the, and again, if you get into all of that with the, the Maccabees and Judas Maccabeus and Matthias and all, it sets the stage for, uh, in the New Testament, They'll, uh, in the Gospels, they'll, they'll use that term, the zealots. You know who the zealots refers to? Those that rose up in rebellion against the leaders of the time. Whether it was Antiochus Epiphanes or whether it's the early Romans, those who rose up, they were standing for the purity of, 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 of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay? 
So they would have thought that the books were important because, hey, they tell the founding of our current nation. But they did not view them as being part of God's word. Uh, they never used them as scripture. Oh, here's a term that we don't hear in, hear in our Sunday morning services very often, the Septuagint or the Septuagint. Um, what is it? What's its importance? How does it fit into the whole discussion here? Um, and it, basically, it was a Greek translation. Remember, we talked about this at the beginning of the lesson today. Common language wasn't English. Common language was Greek. So the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew literature. Uh, it was translated during the 3rd century B.C. Interesting. Translated during those 400 silent years. Um, and why was it translated? Uh, two reasons. Um, during this time, do you think there may have been Jews who didn't speak Hebrew? There were some. Maybe they had been carried away. Maybe they had moved away. And they... We live in this land called the melting pot. And there are times that we are out of... Everybody needs to speak English. Well, you know what? They can speak their own language too. But is it possible that the kids and the grandkids will speak English and not remember the language of the homeland? Sure. How many of you had parents or grandparents that immigrated to America? And if they did, do you remember the language of the homeland? Remember it, I never knew it. Well, if the Bible's written in Hebrew and they know their current language and not the language, of, then what good does the Bible do them? So the Old Testament writings were translated into Greek. That way, all of those people could read it. Even those that were not Jews could now read it. And so that was kind of the idea behind it. That's the way it was written. And so uh, Jesus and the, and the apostles frequently used the Septuagint in their, in their teaching. Um, now here's the question. Do we have an original copy of the Septuagint or the Septuagint? No, we don't. Was the Apocrypha included within that? Great question. We don't know. But even if it was included within the Septuagint, what we do know is that Jesus and the apostles never referenced it. They could have, they, 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 they indeed did reference the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, but they never referenced the apocryphal writings, which were around at that time, most of them. Some of them would come in the early church age. But most of them were around at that time, talking about the Maccabean revolt and all that went with that. And yet Jesus nor the apostles never referenced anything of that. And, th and that, that's important. How do we know that these 39 books are indeed the 39 books that make up the Old Testament? Um, oh, here's one that comes up, and we actually had this one in the news here just eh, fairly recently. Um, what, is the, what is the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? And what do they add or provide to such a discussion? Well, first of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls do not give us a definitive list and say, hey, here are the 39 books that belong in the Old Testament. They don't do that. In fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls is kind of a misnomer. Because guess what they did not find? An entire completed scroll that, comes from, that goes from beginning to end. What did they find? Bits and pieces that they could try to put together. Um, now, some of the bits and pieces were pretty good-sized pieces, but it wasn't as if they had a Genesis through Malachi edition of the Old Testament complete with copyright date at the bottom. That's not what they found. Uh, and so the question is, well, what do they add? What do they give? What do they provide for us? Um, really what they do is they provide some confirmation of what was accepted as scriptures at least within the community of, what is it, Qumran? Yeah, uh, the community of Qumran. They give us information as to what was accepted as scripture from the people who were living at that time. If the question is, why these 39 and not these other 14, then let's find out what did the early people accept. And at, the, at this time frame, this, this uh, community at Qumran, they accepted it doesn't give us a list, but they accepted what's already included, the 39 books that are here. And then the last question here, which we'll 
I guess just about perfect on time. How do we defend the exclusion? Not the inclusion, the exclusion. How do we defend the exclusion of the Apocrypha from the canon of Scripture? How do we defend the fact that the Apocrypha is not included within? Now, in the, the early, we're talking like way far early, like 1611, 1612, 1615, some of the apocryphal books were included. And then they were removed in, in, in soon thereafter editions. Well, why aren't they there now? If you go to the store, if you go online and order a, a normal everyday copy of the non-Catholic scriptures, guess what's not there? No apocrypha. Now, if you want the Apocrypha, that's pretty easy to find. Look for the Catholic Scriptures. Now, there are other religious groups that would include the Apocrypha, but typically that's the easiest way. And that's often, when you get outside of the circles of biblical fundamentalism, that's often how they're defined as the Catholic Scriptures or something along that line. You can be guaranteed that they'll be there. Well, how do we defend the exclusion? How do we defend not putting the Apocrypha within the, script, within the canon of Scripture? And a lot of it goes back to what we've already talked about. The idea that the early founding fathers, the apostles themselves, never referenced the apocryphal, wor apocryphal works. Jesus, who quoted often from the Old Testament, never, no, not once, quoted from the, from the apocryphal books. And there were books, the apocrypha, many of them had been written at that point. Uh, and the early church fathers, the, the apostles and their students, did not reference them. And it's like uh, the apostles and their students and their students and their students. It was like four or five generations of of the early church before we start to find people referencing some of those works and including them as scripture. Well, if they had been around prior to that, why weren't they used before that? Because they were considered to be literature, not Bible. Uh, let me look at the notes here. Um, I like the, the, this first sentence here. It is significant that although the New Testament writers quoted from or alluded to the Old Testament hundreds of times, they never once quoted from the Apocrypha. This suggests that neither Jesus nor the apostles viewed these books as scriptures. I mean, not one reference. If they're referencing the Old Testament as we see it today hundreds of times, you would think there would be one reference to the Apocrypha if they thought it was inspired, wouldn't you? Just one? And there's not. Um, and sometimes within those books, you will find doctrinal teaching that's anti-biblical. You'll find instances where it talks about praying to the dead. Can you think of any religious groups that follow that tradition today? Um, they believe in praying to the dead, uh, and they'll talk, and other things like that. Um, and some of them actually referenced the idea that there was no prophet in the land. That idea that there was no scripture being recorded at that time. So it's a, again, it was a historical narrative, and the early believers accepted that it was a historical narrative, but they never expected it to be included as scripture. And so... You know, the question, why 39? Again, we could have watched the video, but the video is 16 minutes long, plus get it up, queued up. You know, I'm right on time now. I was like, if I plus the video, we're not going to get through everything. The Apocrypha can help us to understand what was happening, but it does not belong within the, 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 the canon of Scripture. If you have a copy of the Scripture that includes the Apocrypha, you know what, if you understand there are 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, and then some historical and poetic books in there, if you accept and understand that they're historical and poetic, okay, 
that's fine. But they are not to be accepted as, not to be confused as being part of the Bible. Um, again, just looking at notes. Um, my Bible with, between, the, between the Testaments. And it has it at the beginning of the Old Testament. But between the Testaments has an, the origin, transmission, and canonization of the New Testament books. Between the Testaments, it sets the stage. How do we know that these 27 are the real 27? Well, guess what I find if I go just prior to the Old Testament? Pretty much the same title. The origin, transmission, and canonization of the Old Testament books. And it goes through and talks about how do I know that these belong here? And here's the section. I got a, an entire, let's see, one page, two, three pages of notes called, Do We Have the Right Books? Um, we could say, How do we know that we have the right books? And that was really the questions that we looked at today. Um, how do we know what we have here are the books that belong here? Let me just wrap up by giving a couple notes here on the, the couple paragraphs that they have with the Apocrypha. It says, what about the books of the Apocrypha? This is a diverse set of books, most of which were written between 200 B.C. and early in the first century A.D. So they're written within a, most of them written within a 300-year period. Uh, let me drop down a couple lines. Um, however, they were never received as scripture by mainstream Judaism, and even fringe groups, such as the Essenes, reckoned them valuable but not scriptural, which is what I what I'd said earlier. Most, most of the people in the, of the time accepted them as poetic or hist history, but not as scripture. Um, the books of the Apocrypha were never stored in the temple, a sure sh sign that they were not thought to be inspired from God. Does not mean that there were no struggles about what was scripture, but we can see what was accepted as scripture and we can look at our Bible and see what was the final outcome. And so, how do we know that we have the right 39 as we move from the Old Testament and prepare to step into the New Testament? How do we, uh, and the best answer I can say is the church using good sense, common sense, and biblical sense has come to the place where they can say without a doubt that here are the 39 books that belong within the canon of Scripture. And we can stand assured today that we have the 39 that belong there. Now, just before I pray, uh, we start the new unit next week. If you want so that you can get a head start, have it to plan and prepare, I have here six copies of the student guide. Uh, and there are a couple, would you say three more on the way? And so if you want that, um, I'll pray. Just raise up your hand and I'll walk around and hand this, this thing out if you want a copy of that student guide for Unit 13, Lessons 121 through 130. So let's pray and then I'll pass these out if you want one. Father, we thank you so much uh, for who you are. Thank you for the word that you've given us, God. Thank you that we can have confidence that the Bible that we have is the Bible you intended us to have. And Father, for that confidence that we can know that the words that we have before us are the inspired word of God, the completed canon.